So, big crowd today. Um, guys, this is a really a collaborative session, so as we go through this, we're going to ask some questions for you guys. Please participate, um, but stop us as we go through this process. Um, we're not here to scare anyone like out of their minds, like, oh my God, it's the end of the world, but it's definitely something you need to be aware of and start start doing something about it. Okay, so uh, my name is Ryan Ballone. Uh I run the sales and marketing for uh, CISO Share and Adam Couch runs all of our professional services. Um, we do a lot of, of work within the market research arena, uh, a lot around their security and security programs. Um, and one aspect of that is GDPR, or what we call like to call it data privacy. Okay? So today we'll just kind of go through it. How many people today already have a GDPR program or are working on one? Oh, I got a little hand. <laughs> That's okay. That's totally fine. And where would you guys say you guys are as far as maturity of the GDPR? Like, is it fully implemented? Are you halfway there? We're halfway there. Halfway there? Okay. I'm guessing some well, are in charge. We're about three, four, three. Right there. Okay. What concerns do you guys have about it? Or what questions do you have about it? So we can maybe answer it as we go through this presentation. Yeah? What do I have to now say no to? What do I want to say yes to when I'm supporting my clients? Like what are the... What are the implications on a study to study, relationship to relationship perspective of the work that they're doing that I'm no longer going to be able to do that I can do today? Okay. And then also, how will it affect us? Obviously, I'm, I'm on the, the um, high development side, I'm not on the tech and the panel side, so we've got teams of people that are working on that. But what the implications are, just from an, my overall just knowledge piece, like what do you think that would, how do you think it'll change the way these panels are going to need to be managed okay. around the IAC? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll address that through that presentation. Perfect. Any other questions? So, hi, I'm yeah. uh, Nick from uh, GMO Research. Uh, we're based in Tokyo. Okay. So uh, we run a platform company. Uh, now all our assets are in uh, Asia. So okay. we don't have any uh, assets in Europe, but all of our, we have many clients in Europe. Okay. So I'm concerned how much we should uh, Okay. And when you say clients in Europe, do they are is are you doing stuff on residents in Europe? Ah, uh, so Asia. Just Asia. No, but there's a difference. So um, my wife's a citizen of the EU. She's oh. living in Tokyo. You have an issue because anybody anybody who is a resident of the EU, they're covered wherever they go. Right. So I mean, that's that's something that you need to be very clear. So, I mean, I was almost going to use your wife example. Yeah, I mean, no, you can, please go I mean go, go ahead. I mean, you, so um, my wife is a citizen of Poland. She's oh. part of the EU. She lives in the United States. Uh, she's a U.S. citizen as well. Mm. But as far as the EU is concerned, she's a EU citizen. And she can't give up her rights to be a citizen of Poland. So she has a Mercedes. And I walked into our Mercedes dealership and I said, uh, hey, you guys collect passive data from my wife's car, right? And they're like, oh yeah, ton of stuff. And I'm like, you know, like service and air pressure in the tires and how far she drives and how fast she drives and, you know, all of the bells and whistles of the car and how she uses it. And they're like, oh yeah. And I said, then internally, you share that with um, your own company to alert her when she needs an oil change or a service or when she should be buying new tires. Or, and they're like, oh no, we have a separate supplier for tires. So you share her information with a supplier who works through you so she can buy new tires. And they're like, oh yeah, that's great. And I said, uh, do you have a plan to be able to alert her every time that you share that information or that you monetize it? Do you have a plan for monetizing her because you're sharing her information? And is there an agreement that you've established with her? And they're like, what are you talking about? We're, we're Americans. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I get that. And, but this is a problem here. Just as it is a problem, I just came back from Abu Dhabi, where there's a ton of them being put in GDPR because it's, uh, let's see, 81% uh, of the population in the United Arab Emirates comes from outside of the country. And the same is true in most of the GCC countries for the professional workforce. So GDPR is a huge, huge issue. Now, you started off with, you don't want to scare anybody. I want to scare the shit out of people about this because it's going to, it's going to bankrupt their companies. Um, now, having said that, I know you guys also will talk about, there, there will be test cases. So it's not going to be like 
as of May of this year, everybody's companies are going to zero. Yeah, the, the GDPR commissioners aren't going to come knocking on everybody's door saying, you yeah, know, do you have this documentation? How are you? Yeah, it, it, there's just too much work out there, right? It's going to be, like you said, test cases. So what we're, we're going to talk about today is really like the foundational aspects that you can put in place. Um, you know, we're not here to give you a silver bullet, but just more educational. This is a collaborative session, so this is a great way to kick it off already. Um, but everything from policies and processes and technology and just things to consider. Um, so maybe we should just talk a little bit more about what the, you know, what this is. But um, this is my favorite. This is actually my second favorite cartoon. The first one's going to come later on. But really, you know, we always at when we when we talk about GDPR, we see this face like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do, right? So it's true. It is a lot. There is a lot of stuff that goes along with GDPR, um, and there's a lot of regulations. And again, what you're going to try to help you simplify and give you some quick steps to um, to start the process. All right, so there's some real key facts. What is GDPR really? The General Data Protection uh, Regulation for the European Union. Um, it's actually, it, it is now considered a, a law before they had a directive that was very similar to this, but this has become even more, um, how can I say, detailed. Um, it's effective May 2018. That fines and penalties, $20 million or 4% of your annual, annual revenue. Whichever is larger. That's for instance, larger. That's for instance right? Yeah, whatever is larger, yep. Yeah. Yes. Um, really, the primary intent was this to give the <coughs> EU residents the control back of their own data. Okay? They're, they're definitely the, in the forefront of this. So we talk about GDPR today, but let's, let's be honest. It's going to go over, all over the place. The U.S. may be next. Other countries will be next. Um, this is just the starting point for this. Um, and also, I, I think the, one of the good things about it is it's standardizing the regulations across Europe. Because if you go to the different countries within Europe, they all have <coughs> a different regulation. This is this was helped to standardize everything. And then uh, the third thing is breach notification. So there is in the United States, there is some states have already put this in place, but the EU didn't have that until now. So within 72 hours. And that is quick. I mean, to be able to determine a breach, what happened, what data records are stored, they require you to report up in 72 hours. And um, one thing that's interesting about that is that in comparison to other industries, so if there is a um, breach, a HIPAA breach in the United States, the HIPAA companies have 90 days to notify before they have to do a public disclaimer. Yeah. This is three days, and it's 72 hours. It's not even three business days. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> learning, learning from the point of uh, inception, really. Right. So if, if it happened you know, two months ago, then you have 30 days. It's when you do find out about right. it. Um, so we'll talk about some of the security aspects um, and how security and privacy inter intermingle um, because there's, there's a plug in there. Okay, so who does this apply to? And we, talk, we already started talking about this earlier today, right? So it's organizations with a physical presence in the EU. And so that's because, you know, you have employees there, you know, and you have their sensitive data. Uh, organizations that process or store data about individuals that reside in the EU, or, or, resident, or actually, or residents of the EU, I should say. Um, so, so, I mean, you could be a U.S. company, but you can process EU resident data, right? You're based out of Tokyo, like right. it said, right? But you, you process some of this some of the EU resident data. So you would fall into this. Um, or organizations that use any third party to process or store their information, right? So, uh, you know, if you guys are processing data for other companies, absolutely. Um, so let's go into kind of what we talk about is personal data, or we call PII. And some of the new regulations, um, well, let me just start. It's any data that can be directly or indirectly um, identify a person. So. Some of the newer things that we've seen out there, the name, address, phone number have all been pretty consistent for a long time, but the new stuff like location data, IP addresses and cookies, and if you can put enough of those together to, to identify who you are, then it's considered personal identifiable information, right? Yep, and it, well, let's take, for instance, um, your wife's car, right? So this is where it gets really, really interesting because um, with this whole internet of things and passive data, you know, and, if you talk, start talking about a car, and then we know the license plate associated with it, the VIN number, um, the location where it gets parked every night, where you know all that in aggregate is is going to be personal data. 
So maybe the uh, MAC address of that car in and of itself, but just by itself, right, is going to be, it's not personal data, but it's when you start associating all those other pieces together. And that's what we'll talk about, is um, understanding what you have within your business, how you're processing it, and then how you're um, protecting it, and the ability to, to measure that. So it's, a lot of it's risk-based. One of the things I don't see up there is um, social media data. So if I'm a corporation and I have an Instagram or Facebook page or some other page where customers um, put up testimonials for which they have, or, or I solicit testimonials and they have a picture of themselves, I've covered a couple of those major things that could also be potentially a liability. Correct. Yep. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And this was just a sample list and the high levels. I mean, there's more there, but you're right. Pretty it's much any data point you, just look at, you have, you have to measure whether or not that's personal data and then the impact that that's going to have, could have on that person and, and your business. So. Yes. Um, is there a, and I'm just throwing this out there, is there a way within consent verbiage where you can work around being, like if you get consent to not have to follow the rules, rules of the GD, of this from an individual person, what would, what would they think about that? So you can't go around that regulation like that and, and have them waive their rights, just doesn't yeah. work. This but there's a way to, so yeah, no, but there's actually a couple things in here we'll talk about a little bit later about consent and some of the things that you can do. Okay. Um, one of the things we also talk about with clients, don't take the information in if you don't need to use it, all right? So if you don't need to collect the IP addresses or the cookies or whatever, don't take it in. Just minimize your risk, okay? Um, same if you're dealing with client data. If you don't need the information, don't take it. Um, pseudo anonymized data is something really interesting that we've been talking to a lot of our clients about because um, in certain cases that we've had, clients are sending them information, but the client still wants to be able to identify them. So what they do is put together a key, kind of like a lot like um, you know a drug company would do clinical trials. They provide all this anonymized data with a key. They have a key store on their side that they have, and so when you we, you could go ahead and process the data and do the research that you can and still be in compliance. Yeah. So when you talk about pseudo anonymized data, um, ultimately what you're trying to do is break the the yeah, ability to easily identify it, right? Um, so if you have the ability to to link it with a key identifier that's held on both both parties, but that is not directly related to like a name or a um, email or phone number. Um, all the other attributes of it can then be uh, considered not uh, directly identifiable. Uh, but this is a little bit more, I guess you'd say it's a little bit more advanced for some, for some businesses because it's in the architecture of the way that you process and store the data. Um, within the databases, how many databases, the tables, that sort of thing. Um, the cool thing about this is that if you're able to pseudo, pseudo anonymize data, um, it actually helps I, I want to say bypass some of the uh, some of the, the controls that GDPR works for, um, but it's it's a definitely a very specific way to process and store data. Can you give an example of, of a technological innovation that allows you to pseudo anonymize data? Um, the uh, blockchain. There you go. Blockchain. Yeah. Blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's the other one? Oh, I was thinking Bitcoin for a moment. But uh, yeah, so blockchain. Yeah, and Bitcoin's not it. No, definitely not it. Um, but yes, blockchain is one way to do that. Um, I'm not an expert in blockchain. I you know, conceptually understand it. But I think that one of the problems that businesses are going to have is that you've already built your architecture. You've already built the way that you've done it. And you've made that investment. Um, you know, it's hard enough for some businesses to go from a uh, traditional data center to the cloud, um, but then to re-architect the way that you process the data and then process that with your third parties or business partners is going to be a, a monumental task. So um, a lot of what we'll talk, we'll, we'll, we'll say um, is good security and privacy is in design. And this is one of the, the elements to good design. All right, so let's talk about data handlers, right? There's two main types, right? You're either a controller or a processor, or you can actually be both. Really, the controller is the one that, that determines the purpose of the data um, and what it's going to be used for. Usually, the primary um, compliance falls on them because what they're doing is they have the data, they own the data, they collect the data, but they're telling their processors how to use it. Um, now, the processor still has some obligation there, but they're, they're going to be the one that's going to be processing the data for you. So. 
let me go ahead and give you an example. Um, so we have ABC companies, market research, they do services, they have corporate clients, and they're taking their data and, and you know, doing the market research that they need to. Within that, they start taking that data and anonymizing it and then benchmark, doing a benchmark analysis on it, right? So they're doing their own type of benchmarking and then they're going to do some services, sell those services separate from their client data. And the question would be is, do they fall under a controller or a processor? They actually fall under both. They're, the, they're, they're a processor because they're processing the client data, but they're a controller because now they've created a new set of, of data elements that were outside the scope of the, of the, of the customer's instructions. So they're actually one of both. And I think a lot of the people that we talk to within this uh, industry are both. You know, they fall under both. Adam, do you have anything on this? Uh, no, I think that part of it is <laughs> talking about third party risk to understanding um, where you sit, you know, are you a controller or a processor, and then having the ability to measure not only your own your own risk and the way you're, you're processing data, but then what you're pushing down and what the what's being agreed upon um, by those third parties. So uh, this concept is not something new, um, but it is something I think that market research is a little bit lacking in is really hardcore third party risk management. Um, and this is gonna impact that because the liability if it falls on the controller, then if your third parties um, have a breach, then they're gonna come asking, you know, where's the documentation, and where, the, where does the liability stand? So I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not gonna talk about, <laughs> and, um, about things I don't really truly know about, but um, that's the concept, is having the risk management piece in place to measure it. Did you have a question? Oh. Uh, I thought I saw a hand over here. Okay. So consent. Again, this, so this is my favorite cartoon, right? Little boy says, before I write my name on the board, I need to know how you're planning to use my data, <laughs> right? It's, I mean, it's because basically today, it's all about consent, right? And when we talk about consent, it's very specific consent. It's not like, hey, check this box and click OK and you're fine, like we do in the US, right? You know, all the legalese. It's very, very specific type of, of consent. Have, have we all done a, a review of our platform, our online platform, the consent process, where the terms and conditions fit, the checkbox, the opt-in versus opt-out? You know, that whole piece is really important um, because it's one of the, the quickest ways for um, an individual, specifically of the EU, to identify whether you've even thought this thing through. Uh, and I think that, you know, going back to use cases, I think that's kind of where some of this is going to start, is you're going to get people start to poke around on sites, or they're going to go to the dealership and they're going to ask these questions, right? And then they're going to start noticing things, and they're, they're going to contact, like, they call the commissioner, like the uh, GDPR commissioners, right? And that's where it's going to be troublesome for companies, uh, is when those individuals, because they're probably going to start going in mass eventually when they figure out that they can review consent on their own, and then they get involved with the commission, and then you have a class action loss. Um, so it's not going to be the other way around, right? It's not the government coming and looking for you to see. I have a, a specific question about consent. Um, I've seen some companies um, send out a mail and say, please opt in to make sure that you're compliant so that we're consigning up to the AR. And since some bring you to a, a landing page of the form, and it's very clear and it's very specifically fill out the form to opt in. Others have you know, said click here to opt in and they have the language in the email and but then you go to the landing page and it's just a thank you. And I'm just wondering if that's sufficient or whether they have to fill out the form after they get to the landing page. Um, from my understanding it needs to be very explicit. So if you look at what GDPR asks for, it tell it wants you to be more uh, direct and explicit about what data you have and then how you're using it. And it needs to, I think the, the process of which you do that is, I, I personally think it's a little bit murky, but if you have a process flow that enables the individual to have the opportunity to see it or go to it, optimally it would be just to, for it to pop up, right? They don't, you don't want them to have to go through these different links. Um, and that's what it's trying to remove is that complexity so that to give the individual the power and the information they need to make that decision up front. Um, does, does that answer your question? Yeah. The other part of that is that it's not a one and done because 
your data evolves over time. So every time they use your data, you have to consent again, and they have to notify you at, on their changes of use of data. Those are those are big big deals. Right. So a lot of that becomes a process issue of how your business is, you know, how you understand <coughs> it, how you use the data. Um, how it's being pushed out, and then how you're notifying. So there's, there's platforms, but there's also a, a, an internal business process that a lot of companies are missing. Um, it's not all just fixed by buying a, a technology platform. It's fixed by having the policy, the standard, and the, and the process to support that. Actually, some of the stuff we've already talked about. Yeah, so this actually touches exactly on what you, what you just asked. So, I mean, I'm not going to go into every single one of these in detail, but we talked about specific, right? I think everybody understands that nowadays, that it can't just be a blanket statement, yes, I consent to you using my information. Or it um, can't be wrapped into your terms and conditions, right. hidden in the back. It needs to be straightforward, upfront, so they can read it. And really, it, it's, it's, a, um, it's a reasonability test, right? So if a reasonable person could go in there and say, okay, it's clear that they're going to use my information for this, that's, that's what they're looking for. Yeah, I think the freely given one is 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 it rather easy to understand. But you know, how many times you go to a site that the boxes are already checked? Uh, so we're trying to remove that out of the out of the process. Um, one of my favorite phrases in all this is um, including but not limited to. I don't. Th I, I think you know. I think you have to remove that, right? That's correct. Yeah. So I actually we, we were um, last week we were at another market research um, event. And I did a review of some of the, of the, some of the sites. And, uh, and I, I personally do that so I, I can, at least if somebody comes up and asks, I can, I can tell them, yeah, your site's a little wacky. Um, <laughs> and, and there was a handful of them, you know? And they're not, I'm not, they're not, I'm not talking about mom and pop shops. So that review really needs to be performed with, you know, a fine tooth comb and make sure that it's explicit because that's the exact language that will get you, uh, get you in trouble or at least lead to more questions. Um, right to withdraw. This one's very interesting because it's difficult for a person to go to your company and then say, you know, what information do you have on me, and then how do I get that out? You know, I think I've seen a lot of companies that they say, well, I don't even know where to start, right? Like, if, if the if the the receptionist gets the phone call and she's like, what what is that? What does that even mean? And then who do I go talk to? So this becomes another process issue and another policy issue. So. Um, a lot of this is is almost spirit based. I want to say, is, you know, are do you have the right things? Are you trying to do the right things for GDPR? And that will come in the form of um, some of the recommendations that we'll talk about with the documentation. But again, having a process, a policy to execute that, um, because that's going to happen. You know, there's going to be companies calling and saying, "What information do you have on me? Um, is it accurate?" Because that's another piece. Mm -hmm. Is it accurate? Um, and then. If I don't want you to have it, how do you get rid of it? And how do you go into the database and actually pull that out, show that you have have pulled it out, um, and, and go from there? Do you have the burden of proof on that as well? I actually don't know about that. Yeah, you, well, you when you have to demonstrate consent, but yes, you'd have to. You'd have there's there's a regulation in there. that talks about that. And you have to know. It's not so much pulling the data out per se, or right. orphaning the data. Um, in a way that it is no longer shared, because you can't you can't eliminate anything that's been shared previously, but you can make it so that um, there's no crypto key or no key access key or hash key that allows you to share it in the future. Right, and I I use the term pull it out because that's what, in most people that's what they think is happening. Yeah. Right. But by doing what you just said, um, you're breaking the chain for it to be to be used. Right, and again that's. You ask anybody how databases work, technology, they're going to go like, that, that, that's not, it's easier said than done. Um, and how, would you, how would you prove that to a general, you know, general resident that you've orphaned out the data and they've no longer had it attached? Yeah, so in a blockchain, it's actually really easy because you have the consensus history that um, takes place every 10 minutes. So you can actually see the moment that it no longer got passed along on the blockchain. So it's a lot of it's in logs, like the way the data is monitored and logged, um, and the accessibility to that. You can you can show that um, that artifact. Oh, demonstrate consent. 
I think that's the other the important one. You need to be able to prove if someone comes in, comes to you and asks you, hey, I didn't consent in this, you need to have a show of some validation on that, that they consented to do this certain thing with your data, which is different than it, it has been before. So. Yep, and so um, how many of us have a, a security program? Just like curious. Cool. Do we have a dedicated security leader in the, in the businesses? That's not brand new, okay. <laughs> Who does security roll up to, just, to, just out, of, out of curiosity, if you don't have a dedicated security leader? CTO. 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 Yeah. 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 Um, how many of us are measuring risk on third parties? Repeatedly, every third party. That's 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 a, a little bit alarming. Um, what about? It is. It's, no, it, it really is. Um, it's a big it's a big burden, and it's resource intensive, right? Um, okay. What about preventive and detective safeguard? So, how many of us are hosted in the cloud? Cool. Um, how many of us know if we have a dedicated security architecture? <laughs> you know what security architecture is? I do, I do oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, went, you went like this, and I was like, <laughs> I thought you were, you were like, well. I hate him. He's better than me. Cool. Cool. Um, so these are some things that like we talk about. So data protection by design. So, um, by design is that the concept of the blockchain, right? So how are we either anonymizing or pseudo-anonymizing the data? If you have that piece um, in place, that, that's, that's one big step in the right direction. Um, but then understanding how it flows in and out of the business and where it's stored is going to be a, a large aspect of that because you can't protect what you don't know you have or if you don't know where it lives. Um, I asked about the cloud because many times um, businesses say, oh yeah, we're secure, we're in the cloud, right? And <laughs> And that scares the hell out of me because um, you know, the cloud, it's a double-edged sword. You know, there's, it's, it's, a lot of times it's service in the box or you know, the ar architecture right out of the box. Um, but the same principles that apply to a traditional network and data center also apply to the cloud. So preventive and detective safeguards. Um, kind of jumping all over the place, but number three talks about data security safeguards. Um, there's there's two sides of that. So what's an example of a preventive safeguard? Anybody know? Like a firewall? So a firewall can do that. What is a firewall? In you know, in the cloud you can have firewalls, but you can have them in different in different um, forms, I guess you would say. So really understanding what your environment looks like and then the access points in and out is is very um, is very important. Um, and, and, and what I would say, also say, sorry, yep. but also where the, that data is stored in the cloud. Yep. If you have EU resident data, is it stored in Europe or is it stored in the US? There's some problems with that, yeah. you know? So you yeah. really need to know, understand where your data is stored. Yeah. Yes. Well, and I'd argue a lot of your cloud data sits in Excel sheets and emails and Gmail when people download and go back and forth, which brings up a question, how does this apply to historical data, right? So we're going through GDPR and compliance and dealing with that right now, but for historical data, what do we have to do with that? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, you have to, the, the consent piece, that's, you have to re-up that. For, because you have all this data and now you have to uh, notify those folks. Yeah, you can't go back necessarily, retrospective, but moving forward you definitely have to and we suggest getting that stuff in place right now to get those consents so that whatever you're going to do with the data moving forward, they need to have consent for it. you're just storing it historically, I mean we, we went on the, the typical American legalese, click here, yeah. we can do whatever the hell we want yes. because we click here, yeah. and covered ourselves that way. Which obviously doesn't apply going forward, but I assume if we're not reprocessing that historical data and we're keeping it, we're okay. That's what I was going to say. So if you're a controller of the data, now you're a data controller of historical data. If you're, if it's only internal use only, I guess I would argue that <coughs> there's not much impact there, but I would, I would definitely look at it further. Well, so, and I, I would actually challenge that because it depends on what internal use means. Yes. So if you have a body of historical data and you're in charge of the GDPR aspects, and you say, okay, 
we're not going to use this data moving forward, but um, it becomes a premise for other data that you do outreach to, then the argument is you have used that data. It's just the basis of the data moving forward. You also have to be able to know who internally your company is using the data. So like when, in the Mercedes example, um, they have suppliers that have access to their data by, database with certain rights for internal and external sales. So internal sales for them means someone within their, their circle of trust, which includes certain vendors and suppliers. So it really it becomes a question of um, what's the, the prudent person test say? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it says, hey, we have data on you from your past experiences. This is how we expect to use it. Um, or this is how we are going to use it. We're notifying you now that that data is part of our go forward. We would like you your consent to do that. And when there's a change of use, we will also reach out to you to notify you of that as well. Right. And so, it gets, yeah, just figuring out how you're going to use that data. And if it's if it's completely split off, like if it's not identifiable, it's just general attributes of males and you know age 35 to 40. Then I again, it, it goes into a risk analysis and understanding you know what that impact is. So um, yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so preventive and detective safeguards is what we we're talking about, uh, but really again. If you have multiple AWS instances, you got a traditional data center. Again, understanding how you're accessing the data, third parties accessing the data, um, the VPNs, the APIs, all that good stuff is really, really important. And then understanding how you're preventing intrusion and detecting intrusion or intrusion. Um, risk management. So, on the risk management side, a lot of this, if you look at GDPR, there's, they talk about reasonable or likely. Um, I think actually they pulled the word likely out of um, GDPR. It wasn't the directive, it was the previous uh, directive for GDPR. But with risk management, you can quickly determine whether or not you have something to be worried about. Um, the first thing is third parties. So we talked about that a little bit already today. Um, but if you're transferring information down to third parties to be a processor of, of the data that you control, um, you really want to have a, a tight process around that and align to not only the controls within GDPR, but another framework like an ISO or a NIST that has practical and technical security controls built into it. Um, so practical is anything around governance, um, documentation, process, um, and then on your, the, the technical side, it goes back to the security architecture. Encryption, um, remote access, um, storage of data, um, network security control, that sort of thing. Um, complete, go ahead. So, we are in the process to get to the actual possibility of GDPR compliance with consulting companies. And they brought in a point that we do have some reporting where the firm might be doing it. What they do is it's a light traffic thing. They download the data, look at it. So, these folks said, okay, you cannot do it anymore, and you have to stop downloading this report, put it somewhere on a shared drive, and see what each column in that spreadsheet is PII or not, flag it, and stuff like that. The reporting is like, for every business, it is a critical part. You just move it on the shared drive. How, how this is going to happen in the future, right? Because you're not, not supposed to have PII in any reports download. Uh, I don't think it's not a matter of not having PII. It's a matter of controlling how it's accessed and then understanding how it's being used and then allowing the EU citizen to be able to so to control it, right? To consent to it and then to know how it's being used. So let's say you were a product manager, you download a report and report most of the Excel spreadsheets, mm -hmm. right? It's on your local computer and it's exposed, right? Yeah. I mean, nothing to question anybody um, whether they will misuse it or something. Right. But according to the, to the guidelines, it's, it's exposed. It's on some computer, the physical file, the email, the email, and the email. How, how? It's the end result of how they're using that. So I can argue that any data is exposed if it's sitting on a server or in a cloud email storage or a workstation. Yeah. But the, the point of GDPR is, um, 
the next, the next, the, the further down the line, the process of how that data is being used. There, it's up to you, you and your company, to then determine. All right, so that person, I have a contractor in Brazil, you know, looking at the data. Great. What is the end result of that? You know, and, and did the person, the, did the individual that I'm analyzing and using their data, do they know that I'm using it? And they, do, do they know how I'm using it? That's the key to this whole thing, is the, 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 the waterfall effect of, of having that data and processing. Does that make sense? So if I understand it right, uh, if I understand it right, it, it only complies to like the third party people. So is it okay to, to get access to all this data to employees? Yeah, you can access the data to you know all day. That doesn't matter. It's Sharing. It's a sharing and the, the usage of that data. Yeah. So if you share it with my company, you know, does that individual or does that database, the hundreds or thousands of people in that database know that you're sharing that information with my company? That's number one that I would ask myself. Number two is do they do they know the end result of how that data is being used? It's like, okay, well, you shared it with Adam's company and then they're using it to do um, a study on certain products or services. And that information, you know, what is the end result of using that? Did that person consent to it? And have they been notified? If you then change the service that you want me to do with that, that data, maybe you want me to do another study, have the, has that database of individuals then been notified of that change and the re, reuse of that data? Does that make sense? Yeah. And, I, and I think the other thing that I think you point out is just overall data security is where another aspect of what you're doing. So if you're allowing project managers to do it, what are you doing in those protective and detective safeguards on that laptop, or what are they doing with that data? That's where I'm looking to from just a data security standpoint, not necessarily from a GDPR standpoint. Right. So you know, when we're talking about security and privacy, security is made up of three main things, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. The, the reason why security moves into this is because the confidentiality is directly related <coughs> to privacy. Right. So some of those processes need to overlap. One of the major ones is risk management. So my recommendation is if you if you're not doing a lot of risk management right now and you have not you know you don't have a very good grasp on GDPR, um, you can get some quick wins by tying into a security risk management or operational risk management um, process. You, know, you need to build out the questions and you know who's going to own that and how you make it repeatable. But that's a, actually a quick win that you can get. Um, by leveraging an internal process already. Uh, projects, the project risk assessment is just what you're talking about. Um, this one's a, one that a lot of companies miss. So if they have a new service they're going to bring online, you know, understanding what that service is going to, um, how it's going to impact the data, and then of course these EU uh, residents. Um, that's one, one, one issue. If I have a new sale and I'm going to be starting a new account, um, I'm going to be taking in a bunch of new data from whoever this is, understanding what data elements are in there, and then how it's going to be processed. Is it going to be anonymized? Is it going to be pseudo-anonymized? Like, what does that look like? Uh, because now you start to measure the risk of that new account, that new database of information. Um, and I know, you know a lot of us do custom projects, so things could be all over the place. But if you don't have a way to measure that, then you're not you're really not acting like in the spirit of GDPR. Right? Um, and then, yeah, major business changes that so you move to a cloud environment or you're setting up just new servers or applications. Again, doing that risk analysis to understand what the impact is all the way down that the line of that service, that product, and how that information is being used, and ultimately the impact to that, that user person. Are there any questions about risk management at all? Um, so in accountability program, a lot of this GDPR is, is about the accountability of these businesses and how, again, they're notifying and, and empowering the EU residents. So the, the triad of how you make things accountable is people, process, and technology. Right? Um, a lot of that's going to be starting with governance. So you start with the governance um, model, and you want to be able to inform the decision makers of the business of um, the privacy and security concerns associated with the data that you have. Uh, if you don't have a governance model, then you're, you're kind of a step behind already because you risk not having the ability to make informed decisions up at the top. And from, at least from where I sit, 
I think that's one of the problems that some of these hacked companies have. That, that the CEO or the CIO or whoever's in charge or accountable for security, ultimately supposed to be accountable for security, they are not getting the information they need to make that important decision, right? So does that mean I need more bodies, um, more money, more technology? But you have to have a way to get that information up the chain. Policies, so policy um, is the what, right? It's what am I going to do and to what level am I going to do it? So having a, a policy that talks about the, uh, the standards that, to which you're going to hold your company to. Um, every time there's a new project, we will perform a risk analysis um, associated with you know, best practice and applicable regulations. Right? And what are GDPR, HIPAA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the process, so what, the process piece is the how. So once you have the what am I going to do, how am I going to do it? And this is what really enables your teams, the technology teams um, and the you know, privacy security folks, to perform the functions that need to be performed. Um, without the how, a lot of things just fall by the wayside, or it's not performed in a repeatable manner. And if you're not repeatable, then it becomes inefficient, and a lot of times things spiral out of control and you, you, know, you don't actually perform. Um, and then ability to measure or report so a lot of times this leads into technology and, um, and it, it really brings it all together, but measuring your environment uh, constantly and reporting that information up to uh, the powers that be within your business is really important. Any questions? I think the one thing, also just to take away from this, when we talk to clients, it's not just about GDPR and about the regulation today. It's it's building out a data privacy program to align to any future regulations that are coming out, okay? That's what we're saying because this is only one and there's more coming. Now, I was about to ask, do you think this is going to proliferate to other markets, kind of going to be the new norm? Yeah, time? absolutely. China just came out with one too, right? Yeah. yeah. It, it's all over the place yeah. and, and France actually has the most restrictive regulations on privacy. Um, but this this is going to be everywhere and not in a very distant future. Yeah, and and what what to write on that like idea is you know we tell people to build a privacy program, not a GDPR program, right? Because if you build the framework correctly with the governance and policy processes, as other things come out, you blend those controls and regulations in, and you're already operating and just tacking on a few more things together. Well, I know we're up against the time, um, or actually we're over the time. Really? Hey, if there's no more questions, thank you for your guys' time. So just before, yeah. so if people have additional questions, you guys are in a company that does these, provides these services, yes. and they can reach out to you, right? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> you try not to do thank you, Alpha. Yeah. <laughs> 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 investor or sales, they, they've actually done a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate you guys' time. Thank you very much. Thank you.